Okay, so this is the second event of the, what I did last summer where we're looking at what our current students are doing for their uh, research opportunities and internships. We're going to start off today with a sophomore uh, who is a biochemistry major, Meadow Van Scathoff, if you want to come on up. So Meadow is also a Scott Science Scholar, and today she is going to be talking about what she did at Blackford Veterinary. Okay, like Brett said, my name is Meadow, and I interned at Blackford Vet News Surgery Referral this past summer. So what is BVSR? So BVSR stands for Blackford Veterinary Surgery Referral. Um, it's a practice where board-certified ACVS veterinary surgeons can practice orthopedic and soft tissue surgeries. So ACVS stands for American College of Veterinary Surgeons, and they have to go through multiple years of residency and internships after veterinary school in order to be able to pass their board exam to be considered a veterinary surgeon. So at this practice, we use um, state-of-the-art surgical techniques um, such as laparoscopic surgery. Uh, we did TPLO repairs, MPL repairs, fracture repairs, and a multitude of soft tissue surgeries. So the one I'll be talking about the most is TPLO repairs. Um, you'll hear me mention that multiple times in my presentation, but I will go into more depth on all of these on the slides. So what was my role? So my role at the BBSR was a veterinary assistant. I took care of patients both pre-operation and post-operation. I did consultations and recheck x-rays. I assisted surgical vet techs in getting their patient ready for surgery. And so we are a surgery referral center. So what we do is we do three surgeries every day. And if we have multiple surgeons in that day, we'll have upwards of six. So there's a lot of patients that need to get ready for surgery and not a whole lot of vet techs. So I would help them get their patients ready and make it go as smoothly as possible. I would also help clean the office at the end of the day, because like I said, we do do multiple surgeries a day. So it can get a lot, a little bit messy in there. So I just help the girl who cleans at the end of the day, clean up everything and get it set for the next. And what I also did was I was a scrub nurse for Dr. Kelly Blackford Winders and she owns the practice, um, Dr. Rebecca Hodgson and Dr. Leanne Blackford, who started the practice. And I'll go into more depth on all these on my next couple slides. So first is pre-operation and post-operation patient care. So the first half of my day, I dealt with pre-operation. So I would fill prescriptions and make take-home bags. So we are a same-day surgery center. So they'd come in the beginning of the day, get all checked in, and leave at the end. So the vet techs would get their prescriptions for each patient. They would hand it to me and I would make all the pill bottles and make them take home bags with all their recovery information so they can set up for a successful recovery for the next couple weeks ahead. I would also assist with pre-operation examinations. So a couple of vet techs, they would have multiple patients a day and they didn't have time to talk to the doctor regarding their patient all the time. So I would come in, I'd help restrain the animal and allow the doctor to do a proper examination. I'd also help take x-rays. So I would have to make sure that the bones are in place on the screen and be able to give the doctor a nice clean photo of what they're going to be getting into later that day for surgery. I'd also assist in getting the patient ready and into surgery. So we would have to make sure they're prepped and make sure the OR is prepped in order to get everything in as fast as possible. So after the surgeries, the end of my day was post-operation. So I would get the patient off the surgery table and into recovery. So I'd have to take the leads off the animal. I'd have to cut the bandages off and clean their leg if you're working on a TPLO, which what we do every single day is a TPLO surgery. And I would have to kind of clean up any blood or any gross stuff on the leg and then bandage it up. And once we got it into recovery, we were able to extubate the animal and make sure that they're doing good after this very intrusive surgery. And then I would clean ET tubes after each dog gets it, dog or cat gets it out of their mouth and I would get it ready for the next day. I would also watch the patients as they recover because once the patients are stable and able to get out of surgery, the 
vet techs would take all their paperwork and put it in the system, and I would watch the patient and make sure that they're still stable, they're not whining and crying too much, and they're able to go home at the end of the day. So after that, I would obviously assist in getting the bigger dogs into um, their owner's cars and help the vet tech explain what their recovery process would look like at the end of the day. So I also help with consultations and radiographs. So radiographs, um, I would have to enter the patient's information into the x-ray system. I'd have to make sure that their name was correct, uh, their performing doctor was correct, and if they were spayed, neutered, just making sure that everything looks good and that the doctor has the right information when the x-rays were sent to them. I'd also have to keep the patient calm during the x-ray because the x-ray table can be very loud sometimes. It's a very cold table and these animals are terrified. So we have to put them up on the table, make sure that they aren't gonna harm themselves or harm us, and just kind of try to keep them as calm as possible. I'd also make sure the bones are lined up and on place on the x-ray. So you'd have to make sure that the patella is in place, the femur is in place, and just make sure that the doctors have the clearest picture they possibly can to make measurements for surgery. So consultations, um, we would have two kinds of appointments that a nurse can set up. They can set up a consultation or a consultation and a surgery on the same exact day. But since I wasn't there long enough and I couldn't practice anesthetic processes, I was only able to do the consultation part. So I would obtain information from the owner regarding the patient's past, their history, and why they're in today. So I just get information regarding if their attitudes changed, if there was a trauma that happened, and how they're doing right now, and if it's gotten any better or worse. And then I'd get the patient's weight, temperature, heart rate, and respiratory rate once I got into the back, and just to make sure that the animal is overall healthy besides what they're in for today, which would usually be orthopedic issue or a soft tissue issue. So after all that, and I got all that information, I would present the patient to the doctor. I would give the doctor everything that I knew from the consultation, and I would restrain the animal so the doctor can do a full orthopedic workup. Then, uh, then after that, I would write up all my findings and put it in the system so we can have record of it for later surgeries or later appointments. So the thing that took up the majority of my day was getting the patients ready for surgery. So I would help administer pre-operation drugs. The vet techs would tell me what drugs they would need, and I would go, I would collect them, and I'd put them in these little things called pill pockets, which are just little treats, and I would just give it to the animal. And it would kind of sedate them in order so they will be more relaxed for the rest of the day because the pre-operation preparation can be very nerve-wracking on these animals, so we just want to make them as calm as possible. I would help take x-rays, like I said, just making sure it's clear and the doctor can measure before they get into surgery. And then I would shave and wrap the operation site. So for a TPLO, I would have to shave the leg and then wrap the foot. And so the foot is able to hang so the doctor can come in and perform surgery on the animal. So after all the preparation is ready, is done, and we can start intubating the animal and getting them into the OR. So I would have to help administer anesthetic drugs and restrain the animal while they got those, and then also hold the animal's mouth open in order for them to get the tube down their throat. I would then attach leads to the patient in order for the vet tech to make sure that they are still doing okay under surgery, and I would also perform non-sterile and sterile scrub. So the non-sterile scrub is the first round of scrub, and you just get all the hair off, any dust, any kind of gross stuff from the preparation, and make sure that it's somewhat clean. And then five minutes later, I would go and do the sterile scrub, and that scrub, I would get my sterile gloves on and make sure everything is as sterile as possible. And if you mess up, you'd have to restart because it has to be sterile for the doctor to come in in order to perform a sterile surgery so there's no cause of infection. And then after all that, I would go alert the doctor that they are ready for surgery and then they can start scrubbing. So the last thing that I did at BBSR was I was a scrub nurse. So this was kind of the second half of my internship once I learned what everything was there and I was more confident able to help and assist in surgery. 
So I was scrubbed into surgery to assist Dr. Callie Blackford, Dr. Rebecca Hodgson, and Dr. Leanne Blackford. And the surgeries that I assisted with was a TPLO, which stands for tibial plateau level and osteotomy. As you can see right up there at the top, that is a before and after picture of a TPLO. So what that does is it adds stability to the leg after a after the cruciate ligament and the which is the ACL is torn or ruptured. So the dog gets a lot more stability or cat from these pins and plates we put in without having the ACL. And then we also did MPL, which is medial patellar luxation, which is that one right there. And so you can see the healthy knee, the patella is in place and not moving, but a luxating patella, the patella moves from side to side when the animal walks or even just stands there and it will pop in and out of place, which is often irritating and can even make the animal not want to use their leg whatsoever. So we'd go in and we would deepen the groove for the patella to sit in. So the patella had more room and it could just sit there and whenever they walk around, they didn't have to worry about it popping in and out of place. I also helped on some FHOs, which are femoral head osteotomy. You can see right there, the, those are hips. And what we do is we cut the hip ball out of the animal and they just live their life without the hip joints and the ball. And you can see on that side, um, it's a normal hip. The one with kind of like a crack in it, that's without it. So they'll live the rest of their life like that. And it works really well on small dogs and cats. And I scrubbed in with Dr. Kelly Blackford on one of these. And she let me keep the cat bones from an FHO. You can kind of see it. They used to be white, but that's how little they are when we actually go in. And then we also worked on laparoscopic and arthroscopic surgeries. And that was what Callie Blackford specialized in. So we'd go in with a little camera. It was minimally invasive. And she'd let me hold the camera and move it around for her. And we would go in and take fractures out and help just the animal take out. And sometimes we'd also stitch the stomach up and we didn't have to cut open very much. So it was very cost-effective surgery for people. And um, the animal had a lot less recovery time. Also, fracture repairs. A lot of little dogs like Frenchies and Yorkies would come in because they have fragile bones. So they would break their bones and we'd have to repair it with pins and screws. And I got to see a lot of those. And it's kind of like putting a puzzle piece back together. And then on one time, I helped with the emergency splenectomy with Dr. Leanne Blackford. Um, her neighbor's dog came down ill and we had to take it's lean out. So that was a really cool thing because I'd only seen um, orthopedic surgeries and bones, but I was actually able to hold the stomach and hold a bunch of different things inside. But that kind of wraps up everything I did at Blackford Veterinary Surgery Referral and what I did over the summer. And I'd just like to say thank you to Blackford Veterinary Surgery Referral for teaching me and giving me experience in the field. And thank you to Brett Longwood, Dr. Siopsis, and Dr. Gibson for giving me the opportunity to intern at BBSR this summer. Do we have any questions from Edo? As you know, this veterinary clinic is near and dear to my heart because they were the reason that my dog Koga uh, was taken care of. Were you involved in any of the referrals like, up to Ohio State and to other areas where the animal comes in, it's kind of beyond the scope of the office and then moves on? Were you able to get involved in anything? Yeah, so we had a couple um, that we couldn't help there because they needed CT scans or other stuff like that. They're working on getting a CT scan at Blackford, um, but we'd have to send them to UT most of the time um, or other major like big veterinary schools. Um, I didn't have to help a lot with that, but we got to see a couple that just, the doctor was like, there's nothing we can do from here. So we had to send them to a bigger hospital. Yes, did you only work with dogs and cats or any kind of other kind of animals that came in? Yeah, so we specifically worked on dogs and cats because um, these specific orthopedic surgeries didn't work, don't really work on other animals. Because I asked about if it could work on like horses and other stuff like that. Their bones are just too big. And the other animals like birds and other ones, their bones are just too small. So it just works specifically for cats and dogs. Uh, yeah, I'll be returning um, over Christmas break to help and this coming up soon. 
for questions? Uh, questions about as far as like the, you talked about the number of patients you see. What is the overall age range? Are most people doing this stuff early on for their pets, like preventative, or are they waiting until it gets to a more severe state? Um, a lot of them it happens when they're older. Um, so we see a lot of like ten year old dogs. Um, but sometimes it can just happen like they're just playing outside and it just ruptures their ACL. Because majority of the time we see the ACLs tear. Um, so we'll see a lot of like older dogs majority of the time, but we do see a lot of younger dogs. And if one goes, one leg goes, there's a fifty percent chance that the other side will go in the year. So we see a lot of return patients as well. That's just a lot of over Yeah. Um, we see, so it's kind of a mix. We see a lot of emergency fracture surgeries because we have to fix them as soon as possible in order for it to put, in order for us to put it back together. Um, like the splenectomy one, um, that was the biggest emergency I've seen. Um, came in at like five o'clock that day when we closed, and I think we were there till like eight o'clock, and um. Yeah, so I had to scrub in with that, and I wasn't supposed to. And Dr. Leanne Blackford wasn't even working that day, and so she came in. And so the majority of the time, they're planned, but we do get a few emergencies. Any other questions? Okay, let's give another big round of applause to Meadow. <laughs> Okay, so now I'm going to introduce our next speaker. Uh, we have Sam, uh, sorry, Sam Stacy, who is a senior biology major, and she is going to tell us about her Vanderbilt RU experience this semester. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? And I was able to work at Vanderbilt over the summer at the Department of Molecular Physiology and Biophysics with Dr. What I've worked on is the function of metabolism and the So first, I need to talk about what adipocytes are and how they relate to our bodies. Adipocytes are the uh, essential component for any disorder in the body. And there's two forms. There's white adipose and then brown adipose. White adipose uh, mostly is the one that stores the energy. So when you are faced with nutrition or access of energy, there's two forms you can use. Adipogenesis is the growth of more adipocytes. Hypertrophy is the growth or increase in size of the already obese. During obesity, there is an increase in hypertrophy in cells. And hypertrophy can lead to hypoxia, fibrosis, necrosis, and overall the death of some of these cells or the lack of oxygen in the cells. And this is what can lead to certain metabolic disorders. So how, how is adipogenesis achieved? If this is the good version of fat development, how do we get this pattern? First, all adipocytes are derived from a mesenchymal stem cell that then turns to a pre adipocyte. When exposed to certain transcription factors, they then mature into a mature adipocyte. The form of um, growth from pre adipocyte to a mature adipocyte, which adipogenesis, is done by a family of enzymes called the CEB family and the PPARGA gamma family. This is right here. So the lab wanted to target this family of enzymes and transcription factors to answer the question, can we improve adipogenesis, focusing on these to combat metabolic dysfunction? This is important for certain things like diabetes or insulin resistance or other metabolic disorders. <laughs> Our current knowledge of adipose is actually kind of limited. And this is kind of a summary of what's going on. Um, but the lab wanted to expand on this because they felt like there was a lot that we don't know. So the, my advisor worked on the BCAA catabolism, which is on that side. Uh, but besides that, we didn't really know what other pathways may lead into the fat so what we normally did in lab, um, 
I didn't work with the mice models, but there were mice models in the lab that they would uh, grow, they then would extract the fat cells, usually white adipose, um, and they would treat the pre-adipocytes with a chemical crop to allow them to grow. On day six, they were mature, and then they would stain them to see what the mature fat cells were. This is an the first slide, the first section, this is a regular microscope, and you can see some difference. But we use something called oil red oil and dilutin stain to stain the liquid droplets in the side. Um, ODP is a fluorescent stain, and so the green are all the different liquid droplets within the cell. Oil red O is the shows the fat. And you can see the difference between the immature cells at A0 and mature cells at mature cell with cells. And then from there, we took the mature cells and they ran, ran them through metabolomics to see if there's any significant signatures um, to help indicate what is involved in the process of cell development. They really just wanted to get a very general idea of where to start. As there's not a lot known about this, as I mentioned. So they were just trying to get a very big picture view of how that cells grow. When they did this, they saw that purine and pyrimidine metabolism were the, some of the highest signatures in fat cell development. And as you know, purine and pyrimidine synthesis is also important for things like DNA. Uh, as that, that's what we're so they were curious to see what exactly this could play uh, in fat and liquid droplets in the cells. To do this, they decided the best way to come at this was to treat the cells with purine inhibitors during growth to see if that would affect how they look when they were mature. So these are the pathways of pure and pyrimidine synthesis and the, um, the names of and the different colors of the blue, green, purple, the different drugs. I particularly work with 6MP and Zorazine. A lot of these are immunosuppressive drugs or anti-cancer drugs as well. And they're curious to see if they stopped these pathways, would it stop the growth of the cells? So these are what they found before I came into the lab, and this kind of led up to what I did. The top shows the Bodipi staining of several different um, families of cells, the top of human inhibitors, and the bottom of human As you can see, there was a lot less of that green stain for cells treated with preserved DNA system. This indicates that there wasn't that much growth there in the samples. And um, to explore this more, they also did a Western blot, which analyzes the presence of proteins. The paraliquid and SAPP4 are markers of mature adipocytes, uh, and tubulin is a control protein that's present in all cells. As you can see, the mature adipocyte marker is not present in the cells treated with 6 and 8. So during my time in lab, I was in the task of replicating new results and making sure that they would apply in a variety of situations. So I took white immortalized adipocytes and treated them the same way. Immortalized adipocytes are a cell line that's basically been grown by humans for a number of generations. This is con contrasted to primary adipocytes, which are taken from an animal model. Sometimes they can act differently because the immortalized cells are not directly from an animal cell. But I started with this to see what I could find. And as you can see, my results are similar to what we found in the previous results. There are some mature cells in the Zorabine uh, sample, and that just suggests that that drug is a little less toxic or a little less protective than the system. My Western blot also shows that the mature adipocyte markers were not present. So next, I wanted to uh, conduct a negative control. So I wanted to see if the immature cells would also be affected by the drugs. So this, these are different proteins that are either associated with glycolysis or glycogenesis. And that they are. In the control, mature cells, all of these proteins show up. But in mature cells that were treated with the drug 6MP, they did not show up. So then I took undifferentiated Immature cells and treated them with these same drugs. And as you can see, the drugs didn't really have any difference in terms of uh, these proteins in this sense. However, it did, it's so it did happen. 
So this is telling us that basically these drugs only affect mature animals. And this is important for future drug development to know what they target and how to make them more specific to what we need. There is presence of ACC, and that is to help with fat growth and immature cells that can be growing in the cell So that's why that one is shown. I also wanted to look at brown animals. So I mentioned earlier that there's two types of adipocytes, white and brown. Uh, brown is the least common, the least, yeah, least common version of our bodies. And it's mostly used for thermogenesis and it actually uses up energy instead of storing energy. Um, usually it's more prevalent in infants or people who live in cold environments since so they need it more to keep them warm during the lifespan. But because this type of fat acts differently from white adipocytes, we were curious to see if the same mechanism can be developed. So once again, I treated these cells with 6MP, and as you can see, the, once again, the mature adipocyte markers are not there. So these cells affect both white and brown. And here's an image of brown adipocytes. The reason why they're called brown adipocytes is because they have an increased number of mitochondria even when they're brown adipocytes. But they also develop about six or seven days similar to white adipocytes. So in conclusion, my research during the helped confirm that specifically pyrimidine uh, synthesis is important in adipocyte growth. But pyrimidine's metabolism is not quite doesn't be required for the development of fat cells. And purine inhibition seems to be linked to differentiation, but not undisruption. Not if it doesn't affect undisruption. So what does this mean? How, do, how does this connect to the goal? The long-term goal of the lab is to create some sort of therapeutic or drug which we can So this research can help give us a starting point to figure out how do we stop the growth of out of the sites, how do we stop hypertrophy? How do we promote all of that? The future directions involve primarily working with brown adipocytes to see if we can figure out how to promote the growth of brown adipocytes since they actually use up energy and therefore would help the metabolic disorders instead of the white adipocytes. The future experiments are also looking at genetic approaches, so genetically modifying adipocytes to see if we can detect it to act in a certain way. Here are some of the people that I work with. Dr. Elmo Dragendorf was my primary advisor, and I also have some of the folks in the videos. Do we have any questions for Sam? So, last year we spoke um, about a di very different kind of experience, right? So, I'm kind of intrigued about. So, for those of you who don't know, Sam uh, worked in a very uh, biology kind of way for last, um, working with horseshoe crabs, is that right? Horseshoe crabs, but also for more of a macro thing, and this is not much more of a micro thing, right? So can you talk about what you gained from having those two very different experiences and where that's led you from there? Yeah, so I've realized that the process of research and the methods that are used are similar in both field and lab research. And so it's kind of applicable throughout science. Um, I've also noticed that through researching through grad schools, but there are a lot of inter interconnections between the field and lab research. So if you're working in a uh, lab that's in viruses, you might go out in the field to collect the samples, bring them in the lab, and study them. So I think having both field and lab experience can prepare me for any sort of situation I want to be in, whether it's something like collecting samples or analyzing samples. Um, but it also just reaffirms that research, how research works, how to conduct it, and how to Present. Which one? I'm going to put you on the spot here because I know Dr. Unger is right there. Yeah. Oh, but pretend he's not right there right now. Okay. Which Which one is Which one's your favorite? Or do you not have a preference? Um, I don't know. I kind of liked this, and I think it. 
also had to do with the fact that I was at Vanderbilt and I got to try a bunch of new equipment, a bunch of new techniques, and I had basically my own little colony of cells that I had to take care of. And that was just something interesting that I really liked. Also, you don't like sand. Right? Yeah, also I don't like sand. <laughs> I, I just want to tack on to, to what was said. I, I appreciated your uh, telling her to not imagine that I'm here, but <laughs> Sam and I talked extensively about this. And what's really important for you guys to realize is that if you get into an internship that isn't necessarily you realize this isn't exactly what I want, that is as important as doing something that's exactly what you want. So when Sam got to the end of the summer, there was a little bit of this awkward moment where you were kind of like, I think I might go biochemistry. And I'm like, that's great. It's great that you had this experience and you did a great job on it. So no matter what you're in, always do a good job, even if it's something that not necessarily is what you're going to do for the rest of your life. But finding out something isn't for you is just as important as finding out something is exact. Any other questions? So I had a quick one. Um, I hope I didn't miss this throughout the beginning, but is there any link or have they considered the link between the rate at which adiposis is occurring and the quality of the adipose cell? Is that something that you have to look at? As far as I know, for white adipocytes, it seems that the rate is close to a week, like six okay. seven days, and that's a very consistent um, measurement. If you like because of my favorite way to induce it to go faster, that might be something. To do, but naturally it has a very set rate. Okay, so it's yeah, it's essentially always occurring. Like it's just a process that is good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you mentioned uh, metabolic conditions. What other ones specifically can this help treat the side effects of Yeah, so insulin resistance is a big one. Um, type 2 diabetes. Uh, there's also just generalized metabolic disorders, so that could have to do with your metabolic rate. They can have to do with your ability to process certain fats, carbs, proteins. Um, but specifically, the big ones have to do with obesity. Any other questions? So that is actually going to be it. We had another speaker, but I believe they're going to be uh, talking at another date now. Uh, so again, I appreciate all of you coming out today to encourage and support uh, your fellow students. And if you came in a little bit late and didn't get a chance to sign in on the laptop while the signal was there, please make sure you sign the paper on the way out so you can get credit for it. Thank you again. Hope everybody has a great day. Also, don't miss our next one, which That's is That's true. Friday, uh, so home, during homecoming, um, homecoming on the uh, 21st on Friday, 12 p.m. in Anderson 140. If you're interested in biology, which a lot of you probably are over here, or having a former student in environmental science, uh, who's working in the So be on the lookout for that in the evening.